you know, I recognize so many names there from in various roles. Everything was shot here. Right. So we did a bunch of the cheating with the plates that we shot overseas, but all, the, all of the dramatic portions were all here. Right. So, so the shootouts, the everything. scenes that looked like a street in Lebanon. Because, yeah. Yeah, and um, we actually had the benefit of using the Film Alberta Studios, and thank you again to Sam Osmond for making this shoot happen yeah. over such a, a long period of time. Normally in productions, for those of you who don't know, it's uh, fully budgeted up front, and you do like an intense you know, three to four week pre-production if you're lucky. You know, two, three weeks of shooting and then wrapping after it. We, we built those sets over almost a year um, with a small crew, small budget, and um, the Film Alberta Studios investment in, in the project. So that was key. Um, and then before then, we actually had the chance to go to Lebanon and shoot some of the plates, um, some of the intro scenes and stuff, and meet some of the people. And that was really key to bring in the flavor of, of into that set here in Edmonton. And we went every single place. Like we went to the village he died, to the refugee camp, to that was his actual home. The real Clark Todd's home. The outside for, shot. The outside shot of it. So everything was absolutely perfectly correct in terms of the visual historically. Okay. So let's talk about that. Why, why the Clark Todd story? I mean, you and I had a conversation when I first met you, and I said, you know, I, I, I was going over the synopses for the various films we had, and I recognized, I said, that's got to be the Clark Todd story, and only because I grew up in his hometown, and I was a young radio reporter at the time, so that story resonated with me, and it's in my long-term memory, and I know there's somebody else in this audience whose path was the same as mine. He was in radio at the time and wanted to be a foreign correspondent, and this Canadian guy dies in Lebanon, so why are filmmakers from Edmonton 30 years later telling the Clark Todd story? Well, I mean, um, you know, nothing in this filmmaking process was an accident. It, you know, we really felt like, not to sound too hokey, but that his spirit and, and what he was doing kind of moved through the film, all kinds of serendipity. I was telling some friends earlier before the film that Alana Anderson, who played... Um, she's here tonight, she's too, isn't she? Alana, where are you? Give away. Yeah. Alana? She's <laughs> looking quite a, bite, quite a bit younger there. in the film than she yeah, does today. She Alana. Um, so From 12 to 13, I suppose. So um, her family, through a friend, responded to a call just on the radio because we were desperate, like a week or two before production, we needed this one actor filled, um, that actually had an accent to pull it off. And they co showed up at the last minute, and it turned out she'd actually performed um, in a series in the UK called Outnumbered um, with the other lead actress who was from the UK that we cast already, unbeknownst that they had moved here to Edmonton. Coincidentally, they knew each other from that previous show, so instant chemistry on set. And, and they were next door neighbors on that show. So, so that's just one little example. Mm -hmm. um, some of the people in this audience that were on the film uh, knew people that were in the village. So there was, it was just kind of this magical process where we felt like we were, we were doing something. And as far as why, uh, why now? Um, you know, because the daughter grew up being a journalist and the journey that was kind of reflected in that emotional blue vignettes, like she searched for the truth and became a journalist herself. And, and I think in doing that in real life, like she wrote a magazine for, was it McLean's mm -hmm. that you, so that was formed part of our research. I read Fisk and Friedman, that article, and we kind of fused the story. Um, but in finding out why he died, it let his memory live on and the people he was reporting on in these stories didn't die either. I think that's why. And I think it's still unfortunately uh, something that's happening to this day. And uh, in, when I, Terry Reese from CBC, where is he, hi, yes. he had, told me about this story in 2001. So really, this has been with me for 14 years. And I just couldn't let go of it. And I actually don't know why. Just like her, I don't know why. What is it? It, it was just something that gripped me. And I went through a number of projects in between. And I'd work on this and do another thing and then put this on the shelf and then do something else. And I absolutely couldn't let go of it. And I don't know why. It was just something that, it's almost like th there was a story that was trying to find us. And it really just took in the last couple of years, couple of years where it just sort of came. And the story ended up being that the daughter, and she just discovered it herself a year ago, she realized she had not cried about her father's death. And she's living in a first world country, has access to mm -hmm. all, you know. And then she, she started a foundation, she donates her time to a foundation called Winston's Wish in London. And it's for kids who uh, are grieving a loss of, a loss of a, an immediate family member. And so they help them through the grieving process. And it could be anything, you know, sister, brother. Um, but she realized herself that she'd ever cried. And then, she, and then she thought about, well, if that's me, what about people who maybe don't have a scar on themselves but have seen horrific things in third world countries, like these children who grow up, and how do they fare decades later? 
So that's sort of what became really interesting. Uh, and that's what she discovered, and that's what we discovered, so we both had sort of a similar journey. And, and how much contact with the Todd family um, in the course of research? Because, I mean, you paint, uh, I think, you know, a, there's a, quite a descriptive character that we see on that, on that screen, and I just wonder how you were informed on that. Oh, goodness. We spoke to everyone. We spoke to his real fixer in Beirut. I found him. Um, his wife, and imagine everyone has their own piece of the story of him, so the wife is not going to know what happened in the field, his cameraman is not going to know the home story, the daughter has a perspective from a little girl, which is just basically a memory, and those can be kind of contorted at times. So what we try to do here is create the whole Lebanon 80s story was in her head, so it was how she imagined it. So it's going to be, we tried to make it slightly torqued, a little bit like the way 80s shows were shot, kind of basic angles and kind of, you know, and her dad was more of a one-note superhero. So we tried to make him like the ironed, pressed, you know, clean, tidy daddy that she knew. And not, I mean, the real Clark Todd was, a, you know, tough, grizzled, you know, he was kind of not like that, but she's seeing her dad right. in her mind. So that's what we tried to do. Right, right. I'm going to open it up to questions from any of you. Um, so just stick your hand in the air and we'll... But you were you were on the couch there in the end, yeah. crying when. She had long, long yeah, long. I had a scene that was cut, believe it or not. But <laughs> we, Actually, it, I it happens. Recall, I don't recall. How, how many other actors here had scenes cut? <laughs> <laughs> we'll set up a grievance table outside. <laughs> it's true. It's part of the. Both of you in there. <laughs> Any, any other questions about, uh, you know, the film, the production, the, uh, you know, the development of the story, what, what you were hoping to achieve with it? I mean, the Clark Todd story is, you know, it's a story that, but again, 30 years ago, what's, well, how, how, what's the contemporary kind of take on or comment? What I felt was, what, Cl what we tried to do is um, get it to inside of Clark. You know, what was he trying to do with his life? He was so committed to this. And he loved his kids, but he was trying to reconcile his love for his family with, you know, if, if someone doesn't report these, who, who is going to? And he was sort of a reporter's cowboy type guy. He really believed he could pull himself out of any tight situation. He actually did many times. So he just had a lot of, he was good at risk assessing. And he wasn't, he didn't do stupid things. I mean, even this place he died at, the, he, the, it wasn't supposed to go like that. So he was not wrong going there. But I think that he was frustrated that he felt like in a two or four minute sound bite, as you know, you, it's hard to really make people, you know, we kind of glaze over, we hear our news and we see it, but do we really, and we can't, I mean, who can emotionally take all that in? It's just way too much. So I guess he felt that a, the two minute sound bite was not enough. So I feel like drama is very powerful. It's a, more, it's a very powerful medium where someone can soak right into it for, you know, two hours. And it's not pleasant. I mean, that's a, it's kind of a dark show. But it's, and, and I had no agenda whatsoever. I knew very little about the Middle East and the whole uh, background. And we, we approached it like a white sheet of snow. Yeah, and I mentioned the names Fisk and Friedman for the journalists in the audience. I, I, we, we did our research on both sides of, of that conflict, the background of his story and the family story. And what we discovered early on, before we even knew about this latest revelation with Anna Todd, the daughter growing up, Filming it, we knew that it was going to be about uh, sacrifice. We had to create a tension. So we kind of built the drama of, of Kalita's fixer, um, and then the tension back and forth. And I noticed even just sitting there, I was like, "Wow, I'm still crying," and this is really intense. And then he goes home, and you're like, oh, "Okay, rabbits," you know. Um, so that's one part of the drama. But then, um, really, at the end of the day, like we knew that the heart of the film, what he was about, was this idea of the the Ferris wheel and breaking the cycle of violence. So. Um, Patrick Sabongi, who played Khalid, um, he's been in a few other Hollywood films in the last couple of years, an amazing actor. Uh, we're blessed to have him, and, and I think he really showed that well. And the scar on his hand, I think, represents Lebanon and anywhere where there has been this level of intense loss. And you just find a way to live on, and it's something that, you know, there's lots of questions that are answered. But, uh, but to not address them at all, it just makes it worse. I'm good. I think I'm good. <laughs> yeah, I thought you were going to say something. Any other questions for Nicolette or Jordan? I'm not okay. seeing any hands. Oh, Back thank there. you. Oh, okay. I'll go. <laughs> okay, so they were watching a show called Button Moon. 
the beginning. And we asked the real kids what was their favorite UK show. So they gave us a list of like, three, and we went and poked through them. I went through lots of episodes to find the... Yeah, I found it on they, YouTube, actually, so it was like, oh. We got the rights cleared and stuff. But, um, but it was a show they watched all the time. So Button Moon, it was just a fantasy place. So they, when they're playing the you know, take off to the moon, you know, Button Moon. So there's a lot of you know, Button Moon references. You know, when they walked out of the church when he died, Daddy's looking up at us at Button Moon with a telescope. And so he tried to put the Button Moon thing in. And I'll just interject there, like the, the line about maybe Daddy's up there. I mean, it just killed me again. I, mean, I know it's going to come, and I'm still crying about it. But uh, it's kind of a metaphor, I think, for, for t you know, it's not a real truth. It's just a truth that we tell hmm. to get through as well. Right. And also, um, when she... She was holding on to the moon, like she, she was holding on to him, I guess baggage or whatever. She hadn't cried, she hadn't really dealt with it really. And so at the end, when she's letting her button moon go back to the sky, whatever, it's sort of like I'm letting go of the moon that she just held on to it too tightly. So it was, we were trying to do that with the buttons. And we have so little, I mean, it's already a long, almost two hours. So we couldn't take the contemporary storyline. We had to kind of condense it into some abstract, those blue things, which, you know, that was sort of her inner journey as uh, an adult. Um, and then she realized, and this actually really happened in real life, where she just discovered a year ago, she was a, a psych psychologist for some other reason, and she started bawling because she was telling her psychologist about this, and the psychologist couldn't believe that she hadn't told her, him, about this. Hmm. And they had been seeing each other for all these. So it was like, just, it came out. And yet that was, you know, she wasn't even there, she didn't see it. And so her whole thing is, what about people who are kids, people who have been through way worse? And so that was sort of her, um, her journey, which is, uh, yeah, it's, it was interesting to me. And, and to her, too. She, I mean, when I first met the family, this certainly wasn't what I thought was gonna, right. going to happen. So we had to make the story match the real, their real journey as we were making our film. So anyway. I'm sure you have people in this, unless, unless there are any other questions right now, but I'm, I'm thinking you have people you want to acknowledge uh, oh that are probably in this everyone? room. <laughs> okay, everyone. I'll, I'll start by, I mean, my mother and my aunts, Auntie Olga, Annie, Joan, those are, you talk about family and seeing all the credits. I mean, I had closest family help us out in that they right. cooked food for us and Sheldon Woloshin and his group, Contraption Studios, we called them the magic team because they, he pulled together a group of amazingly talented people and literally, we built those sets out of scraps. <laughs> In some cases, literally odds and ends. <laughs> Why are people laughing? It's true, <laughs> it's true. And, um, Such a glamorous business. <laughs> we have a painting department, <laughs> they're just giggling over something. <laughs> what is she laughing? And um, gosh, and then, my, I've, then some of my closest friends, like uh, Kathy and Slavo, Slavo, who did, I'm sorry, he hates my, but he did, he's a metal artist, and he did the Christmas trees on um, the Telus building in the city, the big, you know, the ones that light oh, up wow. Christmas, yeah. So he's a friend cool. of mine, and he did all of our, we big, go way back. We go way back, no. <laughs> He did all of our metal iron, Beirut wrought ironing. Yeah, that stuff looked good. That I mean, I've, I've, here. So no, every nice. little, and good. then, you know, my brother is a welder, and I have, gosh, uh, we had also all of our actors, almost every actor was from, we had over 100 actors, as you can see. And, and the them. guy who played uh, Clark Todd. Uh, Dan McInnes. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, th I thought he was great. <laughs> really, sure. As a, as a journalist, yeah. that's good to hear as a journalist. So you, you believed him? Yeah. Yeah, you I did. Him? I did. Yeah, I don't know if I had him. Yeah, I thought he was very good. <laughs> is he based here in Edmonton now, or is he he's one of these? Toronto so right now. he's one of these, yeah. I had a but everyone was right. just... Grab. I'm trying to think. Of, okay. I know we're forgetting something. Too many people. We'll see you in the pub no, after. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah, there you go. So is that the plan? We're heading to the pub? Yep. We'll Any other there. questions before we head to the pub? Oh, one over here. Yeah, oh, the uh, movie, The Comment, uh, Truth is the First Casualty of War. I remember reading years ago how many journalists up to that point in time had been killed covering conflicts. I don't know what the number is now, but it's amazing that they're still doing what they're doing out there because unless people know what's really going on, uh, yeah, and there's a scene that was actually one of my favorite scenes is um, where he's sitting with the vicar after, you know, he goes to church trying to find some peace and he ends up finding it at the pub <laughs> with his friend, the vicar. And um, just the line about, uh, you know, he's doing God's work, but then the, the parable about the man in the forest, kind of a take on the, if a tree falls in the woods, and does it make a sound? And I think that that's it. Like, 
um, it's worth the risk. I think and we, we actually grappled with this question, like, is a story worth dying for? It's not what the movie's about, but it's about the daughter's journey. But I think at, at the core of the story, it's that, yes, it's, it's worth the risk and that there, it is a gamble. Um, and, and if no one does do that, then these stories aren't told and we can't learn from them then, collectively. I also just want to say, um, I, have to thank, I have to thank my comp the composer. I don't say, he's yeah, not Mike, my Mike Shields not won my an composer, Ampia Award for this soundtrack. Where is Mike? <laughs> he's here. He was there. There he is. Mike. So th the reason I need to like, genuinely thank Mike, who's done all of my movies, by the way, um, He's amazing. He did that in two weeks or less or something, something ridiculous. So he was amazing. And he won an award. He won an Ampia Award for it already. So it's, it was, I think it made such a difference to the, um, the drama. And he's from Calgary, but that's OK. <laughs> <laughs> we still love you. Excellent. Oh, we have a. Yeah. What, what I loved, well, CTV initially developed it and gave me the initial license. Broadcast license. Broadcast license. Yeah. And they're still going to air it, so it's going to air on CTV. But I was very fortunate to have, in a long, to make a long story short, it just ended up that I ended up having total control of the production because of a mistake CTV had made, and I was able to prove they made a mistake, and I ended up having the whole thing to myself. So what was really amazing about that, and what I loved about this project, is that normally you have so many people checking your scripts and making changes and changing this and changing that. And I just did it completely on my own, which is so rare. We had no distributor. I did it without a distributor, which again, they'll have a say and they'll, and you can get a lot of contortion. And I, I really wanted to just be completely true. And we tried to take no sides. Like we weren't taking sides on, you know, the Lebanese story is just the backdrop and we didn't have any, we just wanted to make sure it was just accurate. The movie was about and the and daughter. I, and, and to that note, quickly, I know you asked about CTV, but we went out of our way to make sure that whether it was the Israelis or the Druze or the Christian Falange Militia or the PLO, that it was clear that there was a reason emotionally to the audience, that there was a human reason why they were doing what they were doing, whether it was reprisals or whatnot. So I think we wanted to just flavor that to not, not just protect ourselves legally or whatever, but just to honor the story of what happens, because mm -hmm. there's always two sides. So in terms of CTV, I think, it was great you know, to be able to access some of the archival footage at the end of the reel where he's passed away. I mean, that's all you know, courtesy of CTV. So I think you know, in that way, the legacy lives on too. You know, like what they're all about and journalism is all about. You know, they, they, were, they want this story to be told as well. And, and again, magically, it happened the way it did. And we were able to tell a very, we hope, honest and truthful story. So, so when will we see it on, on National Network? It's next. It's already finished to run on Super Channel. Okay. Which, and they, Super Channel was amazing. Yeah. Get a subscription. <laughs> <laughs> no, they were, because we had a number of um, versions that we had that we kind of, we had to have air by a certain time just to legally meet some tax credit rules or whatever. And, <laughs> um, and they were very flexible. And then next is the um, CTV airing. Right. nationally but we're going we have a bit of a festival run too so we started here and then we'll go to um we've got some things coming up so Great. yeah um trying to think gosh i, I know there's so many people here the I pub. Think. Not the pub, pub. Jordan. <laughs> jordan says pub <laughs> who votes pub <laughs> no i just want to say like honestly like every actor i'm just so proud that this is and the other thing too i have to say with my other movies when you have a broadcaster control from toronto and again i've always enjoyed working with everyone that I've worked with so there's no complaint there it's just they want you know this person from Toronto this person from Vancouver and they'll maybe approve like four actors from Edmonton so we had uh, complete control and I, I think that the Edmonton actors here to do all those different accents well in the Lebanese community I mean the people that came out really <laughs> made it like it, uh, every time I see a face I'm like you are personally responsible for this thing being what it is we really all are equally you know, responsible for what's, what was up there tonight. So thank you, and Mohammed back there, thank you. <laughs>